Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast. Welcome. Hey man, so... Um, what do you want to talk about, sir? Past few weeks we've been talking a lot about uh, classical weapons. Yeah, so man. So Bachamdo, Spear, Pole, nice, yeah. six and a half point. Yeah, right? weapons are fun, yeah. Yeah, so we've been getting some questions about those. One question that came out actually a few times is, uh, uh, which one should you do first? Weapons or hands? Hand work, you, should you train your hand for it and then weapons yeah. or should you just start with weapons because you don't really need to do the other one mm -hmm. different schools of thoughts like in Wing Chun right you have to do level one to four yep. before you touch the pole mm -hmm. and the knives yeah. and then uh, other styles like uh, maybe the Filipino like Kali they just give you a couple of sticks or knives and you yeah. just no empty hand right yeah so uh, That's true which one? Oh, and then there's yeah. a follow up to that as uh -huh. well right and the follow up is uh since they're classical weapons, we live in a modern age. Yeah. Why would you learn how to well, swing a machete a nine, or big nine, nine foot, foot pole? Spear and walk You're just around. walking down to the store, yeah. right? It's, yeah, uh, I can see that kind of thing. You know, yeah. so these two. Um, but like, it's exactly like you said. You know, people sometimes they get really attached to their beliefs. Like, if you learn weapons before you learn empty hands, you're going to screw it up because the weapon is an extension of your body. So you must learn empty hand first. If I catch you touching a weapon, you're doing push-ups. So that, I had teachers like that when I was a kid, right? Yeah. But then you got out of school thoughts. Like, day one, they give you a weapon, and they go, well, actually, this will help your empty hand. So which one's right? I think they're both right because they're both um, proven. I mean, you got... Filipino, African, Indonesian, Malaysian martial art, where on day one they're already grabbing a weapon, right? You're gonna tell me they're not good martial artists? They're moving just as good, just as fast, just as powerful, just as eye hand coordination, reflexes, footwork, everything, all their attributes, just as good as someone that disagree with that paradigm, did their weapons on day one, right? In right. the same time, people that said, oh, you're only allowed to do hands first and then weapons. Historically, there has been people that also turned out pretty good with weapons, even though they started with empty hand first. So both school of thought is correct, right? So I didn't, even when I was a kid, I never, I was a really bad student, right? <laughs> my sifu was like, you're not allowed to touch a weapon until you get good at empty hands. Mm. And I'm looking at my friends, or I'm looking around in the mushroom community, I'm like, well, that guy started out with just weapons first. He turned out really, really good. So what are you talking about? So as you look through history, you see hundreds of examples of this, right? From all around the world, all cultures, different arts. So now that gives you a very good insight into, because it's not belief, it's proven. So it gives you a good insight into how the nervous system works. So I, I really disagree with both schools of thought. I think you you can do whatever you want. You want to do weapons first, do weapons first. You want to do hands first, you do hands first. Now, if you look at, if you look at it like past modern martial arts, traditional martial arts, but you go all the way back, all the way back, then you got wartime, right? Then you go farther back than that, you got tribal times before it was civilized. I can't find an exception, but maybe there is. But all tribal martial arts were weapon-based, which makes sense. You never well, yeah. go to war with just your hands. You go to war with a weapon, right? Right. Like a rock, and then they, you know, they make clubs, and then they figure out stone knives, and then they figure out you can put the stone knife at the end of a stick, and you can hunt bears with it, or whatever, or a group of us. So. If you look at the history of our species, it's definitely weapon-based first. It right. was only after wartime that it became empty hand martial art, right? But during peacetime. But during wartime, empty hand martial art was really a backup system. You only do it if you fell off your horse and lost your sword or you dropped your stick or someone disarmed you. Then and only then would you use your empty hands. And only as a backup. What that means is you're not trying to end the fight with your empty hand movements. You're just trying to buy enough time to grab your weapon again, right? Because it's war. Right. So if you look at that way of operating, that makes way more sense. Because now even in, uh, even in modern times, right? Um, I'll make the story short because it goes into self-defense and combatives. But someone breaks into your house, and a good friend of mine, a student, was telling me this. The first thing he did was grab a weapon. He didn't even know he did. He just did. The other night, you know, there was an animal in your house. The first thing you did was grab a stick and a broom, right? You didn't even know you did it. No. Nope. Right? One time when I was uh, much younger, I was a teenager, someone was on a roof of her house. They broke into the townhouse, and my mother screamed, right? Me and my brother, we ended up grabbing stuff from the kitchen, weapons, right? We went up on the roof, right? I don't remember doing it. I don't remember making a conscious choice. 
Yet I was only training empty hands at that point. As a kid, I was doing karate, boxing, kickboxing, and Wing Chun. I was, I think I was 14, I can't remember. I didn't have any experience of weapons yet. But what happens when shit hit the fan? I go and grab a weapon. So your reptilian brain, the tribal ancestor part of you, the part of your DNA automatically grabs a weapon, right? If that is true, and it's still true nowadays, everyone that I ever know that ever got into trouble always grab a weapon. If that is true, then why don't we pay attention to that, right? You look at um, MMA, right? Which I got high respect for, but there was this MMA fighter, he's pro. He owed people money, three guys came and collected. It's no longer a duel, it's not a sport, it's not sparring, it's not games anymore. Now his life is on the line. He grabbed a knife and he killed one of them when there was three guys. There's no weight class real life, there's no single combat, there's no safe surface, there's no referee, there's no rules. There's no, you're not allowed to ambush me. There's no, you're not allowed to have a weapon. When it's for real, all these variables are stacked against you. That's the whole meaning of crime. As soon as it's instinctively, you grab the knife. Or you look at another uh, MMA guy, Frank Shamrock, he was a champion, right? Yeah. Crackhead pulled a knife, he ran. Because a guy that's this good at weapons can beat someone this good in empty hands. That's why we use weapons. And... So this idea that should you use weapon first is not so much an intellectual decision. Because as soon as it bypasses your intellect, as soon as your family's in trouble, you grab a weapon. Right. So it's not a decision. It's more like, what does your lifestyle allow? Right? You, you look at a soldier. He's got like, what, a few weeks to prepare combat for war or whatever? A few months, whatever? Depending on the... You're going to train him five years in empty hands? <laughs> No, you give the guy a gun and teach him how to use it, right? Weapons. Cops are the same, right? Private security sector is the same, right? Back in tribal times, it was the same. Back in wartime, it was the same. The only time someone has the luxury to say, eh, I don't want to do it, is because, or I'll do it later, is during peacetime. So if your lifestyle, if you examine it, allow you to have that kind of luxury, that's great. That means you live in a peaceful society, you have a peaceful lifestyle, you're a good person, you have very peaceful... Um, Lifestyle, that's great. But that doesn't give you the right to judge people that uh, unfortunately doesn't have that profession or lifestyle. And they might go with weapon first. But what I'm trying to say is it is instinct instinctive. Your gut already knows the answer to that question. Anyone that asks that question never really thought with their gut. They only think with their brain. I mean, the upper part of the brain. Right. Yeah. What that means is that they have never been in shit in their life. Serious stuff which is good, they had a good childhood, a good upbringing. But, and I'm happy that you have a good upbringing, but it doesn't give you the right to not really use your brain, right? So, yeah, you, historically, and more importantly, instinctively, we use weapons first. And any martial art that look at weapon that says secondary supplement training has forgotten the history of martial art. Before there was peace, it was always wartime, before wartime was tribal time. Most martial artists went through that, right? right. And it was always, the root of martial art is always weapon. In fact, I argue, if you don't do weapons training, technically speaking, very technically speaking, you're not doing martial art. Martial art, martial means war. War art's always weapons, right? So I'm glad a lot of modern martial arts still has weapon training because of that, for many purposes, right? But one of it is what we just outlined. As for, you know, we can't really carry a nine-foot spear around or a big or saber machete, yeah, or machete, yeah. and we're not on horseback anymore. A lot of cutting techniques were designed for when you're on horses. So why should we learn this stuff? Well, it increases your attributes in a way that empty hands simply cannot, mentally and physically. I mean, if I want you to move your feet laterally, a lot of guys are pretty stubborn. I can drill you in empty hands and go, Chris, move your feet, move left, move right, move forward. And some people have the temperament and also the inclination and movement to pick it up, right? Some people don't. They hold their ground. They like to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They're stubborn, right? So that guy might train for five years in empty hands, and he's going to have a hard time doing it if that's his temperament. But you take the same guy, you take a machete, you swing at his knees, that guy will suddenly become a dancer. He'll become very agile, very, very quick, even if the machete is not laser sharp because he's tapping into something in his genetic memory. Sword, knees, not good, let's move. So, right, right. so he, he gets rid of that really quick, right? Not to mention, uh, he teach you ways of 
swiveling and looping around angles that anti-hang guys usually don't have. I mean, you get punchers that can do that, like uh, Ali when he was in his prime, or Mayweather. Some of the combination that he throw was like, all right. They, they never touch a weapon, I don't think, but wow. But how many guys are like that? Right. Very, very few. But you look in the weapons world, they're all like that. So if you took that technology, not even technology, that natural instinct of looping, and you put that into an empty hand guy, he's going to be able to overcome inertia way faster, right? So that will increase your speed and increase your power, right? Now you look at accuracy, right? I mean, if you're working with flexible weapon, for example, or you're working with projectiles, that's all accuracy work, right? right. That increases your distance sensitivity that you won't be able to pick up with your hands. Right. At least not as quickly. So it accelerates your attributes. Or you look at eye-hand reflexes. If I see a punch coming, what's that? 50 miles an hour, even if you're a quick dude, 60 miles an hour. But if, you, I put, if I put a stick or a sword in your hand and you're really good at it, that's over 100 miles an hour. So I'm getting used to looking at things as over 100 miles an hour. What would happen if I look at your hands again? That's only 50 miles an hour. Yeah, it's pretty slow, right? Yeah, so I learned how to tap into my brain to have better reflexes. Also, my emotional, um, the content of my emotions and also the way I manage my emotions. I, you're bigger than me, you're stronger than me, you're tougher than me, you, you, you hit hard. Okay, I'm scared, right? I put a machete in your hand, I'm 10 times more scared. I put a machete in this hand and I put a knife in this hand, I'm 20 times more scared. So my chances of de developing courage and bravery through weapon training is not even an option or available in empty hands. This is precisely the reason why during peacetime, dueling happens. During wartime, dueling never happens. Right. When or criminals. Or criminals. You're saying animals. When they're fighting the exact same species for seeing who's the most alpha, intentionally there's no killing. If dying happens, it's a pure accident. If the other creature shows his belly, they're usually left alone because it's about social status. So therefore, it's not lethal because you don't want to weaken the tribe, right? Right. But when animals are fighting a different species for food, killing is directly his intention to eat it. If dying doesn't happen, now is an accident, mm. right? And if you look at the tactics too, whenever it's dueling, there's a lot of warning involved. There's a lot of posturing, right? When, it, when they're eating or hunting, it's all stealth, right? Humans are the same. Now we fight each other, we have rules, weight class, make sure it's the same size, make sure it's one-on-one, -on -one, make sure there's no ambush, make sure there's no weapons involved, make sure there's no poison involved, make sure all this stuff to make sure that we're safe just to entertain a crowd so we can feel we humiliate each other, we act tough, we bully each other, we challenge each other, we force each other to fight, but making sure none, nobody's in real mortal danger, right? right? That's peacetime. But what happens when we're serious? Look at soldiers, look at cops, look at SWAT team. Look, when we want, look at how criminals operate. Ambush, multiple opponents, weapons. Nothing is fair. It's not, you're not on safe ground, there's no rules. The intent is to kill. The intent is not to not hurt each other, but feel tough. So what kind of character are you going to develop? If you took one person and you say, hey, man, I'm going to teach you to make sure you only fight when you think you can win. You only fight if it's safe. And if people don't want to fight you, force them, humiliate them, challenge them, act tough. Be as loud as you can be. Make sure everyone can see how great you are. Teach a child that. And then another guy goes, look. Fighting is not your choice. It's not your choice. Too bad if you don't want to. If it's forced upon you, you have to protect people you love, you move. The odds are stacked against you. It is a very dangerous thing. So don't do it unless you have to. Try to stay out of trouble. Try to keep your head down. Don't telegraph. Don't pick fights. Don't humiliate people. Be kind. Because as soon as the sword comes out, someone's going to die. What? Compare to character traits. So not only is it physical attributes and mental attributes, but it's also emotional attributes. Weapons changes people. The only exception is if someone is extremely psychotic. In that case, they shouldn't touch weapon training, right? Yeah, that's a yeah. big one. <laughs> and luckily, most Indonesian, African, and <coughs> Filipino martial arts are not like most MTA martial arts, where if you have a credit card, they don't hate your character, they'll teach you. Weapon martial arts usually are still pretty tribal. They don't do that. 
they'll show you some sticks, but they won't show you much blade work. If they show you blade work, they won't show you the combative side of it. Just some flow stuff, some counters, some angle work. All right, but they got to watch out, right? Because there has been cases where people learn this stuff and go kill, right? So when you look at weapons and empty hands, it is not just about the physical, but it's also about the mental and the character, the type of person you'll be. Neither one of them, they're both good for you, but if you take it to the extreme, they're both bad for you. One can become very dark and dangerous. The other one be become too e egotistical. But if you tone them down, they're both pretty good for confidence, right? They're both good, right? So that's also very important. As for, like, it's not just about, we, we touched upon why even if, a weapon's really large, it's not practical to carry, we still gotta learn it to increase all these attributes, right? Right. But it's yeah. also about ad adaptability. I think I said that in the last Kung Fu report, but yeah. you should be able to use any weapon at any length at will. If there's a spear, a hammer, a screwdriver, a cane, a sword, a bachamdo, a long pole, a spear laid out on a gigantic table right now, you should be able to pick it up with your left hand and use it, and with your right hand and use it any one of those weapons. You should be able to use it in combination. One hand's holding one weapon, the other hand's holding another weapon. You should be able to use it with any grip, either like if you have a stick or even this bottle, you should be able to use it in an ice pick grip, forehand grip, or right in the middle grip, and with neither hand at any time, and drawing from any angle, against any angle of attack. That's a weapons man. But just learning a few tricks, no, you're not qualified yet. But if, if you lay down all these weapons and the guy can just close his eyes, pick it up in any grip with any hand and use it against any weapon that you pick up, that's, that's classically what we mean by a warrior or someone that can use weapons, right? Yeah. Well, as always, man. <laughs> and it goes farther. Oh. Let's say we take a blade, right? We laid out different blades on that table. You got like moon-shaped curved knives, you got S-shaped knife, you have straight knife, you have really Y-shaped knife, you have one side like a moon, one side, whatever. You got different designs of blade, right? You take a person before you train them. In the old days, they did this. Nowadays, it's rare. And you go, hey, man, pick the blade you like. And by the, what knife he picked, this is not 100% true. I would say it's about 70% accurate. You can tell what kind of character this guy has just by the knife he's attracted to. Each design has a very specific personality character trait, right? Designed by a very specific person. So, you know, it gets pretty trippy. Yeah. You ever tried it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same with sticks, right? Oh, yeah? Yeah. So if you, if you look at it from a meditative point of view, they will use sticks and knife in a way to help them meditate better. Maybe in another episode I'll talk about that, but it gets pretty trippy. Anyway, oh, cool. any other questions, Chris? No, that's all. As always, man, you got uh, way beyond. Thanks, man. See you again. See you next time, guys.